This is the first lecture from Chapter 4, and this lecture is about stoichiometry. Before we start talking about stoichiometry, I just remind you a little bit from Chapter 3, how to read a chemical equation. We talked about how to balance a chemical equation and that the numbers and types of each atom have to be the same on both sides of the equation, and that's to satisfy the law of conservation of mass. When we talk about quantities in a chemical reaction, the most common question is probably, how much product will I get from this reaction? So when we talk about quantities, then we're into calculations that chemists call stoichiometry. And that's the calculation that involves getting from reactant to product. A good place to start is, first of all, to remind you, we've talked a little bit about moles and converting from moles to molecules and moles to mass. But all of these conversions involve just one substance. So if we were talking about C8H18, H18, for example, we could convert the two moles here of C8H18 H18 to molecules, and then we could also convert it to grams. But we have not talked about, if I know, if I have a certain amount of C8H18, how much CO2 can that make? That's stoichiometry. When you have a chemical equation or chemical reaction, and you're comparing quantities of different reactants and different products. Understand, before we get going, that the coefficients in a balanced reaction can be thought of as either molecules or moles. These coefficients are counting coefficients, so they won't ever represent, for example, grams, okay? Just a quantity, a counting quantity. So we're going to start with mole ratios. A mole ratio is what allows us to compare different substances. So for example, if we wanted to compare quantities of C8H18 to carbon dioxide, we would first look at the mole ratio of C8H18 to carbon dioxide. And you can see that the mole ratio in the balanced equation of those two is 2 to 16. So we could say, okay, the mole ratio of C8H18 to CO2 is 2 to 16. This mole ratio is the first step in carrying out a stoichiometric calculation. Um, this is our conversion factor from a quantity of one substance to quantity of a completely different substance. Let's look at a simple example. Here's the same reaction. And by the way, if you haven't already committed to memory what a combustion reaction is, you need to do that. So how do you identify that you're dealing with a combustion reaction? One of the reactants is always oxygen, and the products are always carbon dioxide and water. Expect on the next test to be asked to write out a combustion reaction on your own, remembering the reactants and the products. So back to the stoichiometry. What if I told you that I had 22 moles of C8H18, and I wanted to know how much carbon dioxide that would produce if it were burned? How would you figure that out? Well, you use the same general procedure we've used for unit conversion. So you start with a given information, which is 22 moles of C8H18. Now, it's, it's important this time to not only put the units, like moles, but also to put the substance itself because now we're dealing with different substances. And if you don't put, for example, C8H18 here, you might end up putting the wrong thing in the denominator in your conversion factor. So now anytime you're comparing one substance to a different substance, you need the mole ratio. Since 
The units of our given information are moles of C8H18. Those units have to be in the denominator of our conversion factor. Our conversion factor is the mole ratio. So you look at the balanced reaction, and there are 16 moles of CO2 for every 2 moles of C8H18. Cancel your units, and this ends up being math-wise 22 times 16 divided by 2. And that tells us that theoretically we could make 176 moles of carbon dioxide if we burned 22 moles of C8H18. There's something we call a mole map that helps quite a few students. Um, you don't have to use it, but it ends up being very handy, so you may want to jot that down. What that tells you is how many, let's say we start with grams of a particular reactant, which we'll call A. And let's say the question is asking you, okay, if you have this many grams of A, how many grams of B, and let's just say that's the product, can you make? Well, you cannot go from grams of one substance to grams of a different substance. Uh, you can't compare mass of one thing to mass of something else. The only way to compare two different materials is to use a mole ratio. So remember that. They both have to be in units of moles before you can compare different substances. So this is the path we need to follow. If you're given grams of a certain substance, you convert the grams to moles of that same su substance. Notice we're still talking about A. And hopefully you remember from the last unit how to convert from grams to moles. You use the molar mass. Once you have moles of substance A, now you can compare it to moles of any other substance in that chemical reaction by using the mole ratio. So by doing a mole ratio calculation, we can then get moles of the substance the problem's asking us about. We'll say that's B. And then, once we have moles of the right substance, we can use molar mass again of B and get grams of B. So how many steps is that? Um, that is one calculation, two calculations, three calculations. So going from grams of one substance to grams of a different substance is three calculations. Here's an actual example. Here is a chemical reaction, so decomposition of potassium chlorate. And the given information is that you're starting with 25.5 grams of potassium chlorate. Um, now, what I like to do in stoichiometry is I like to write quantities that are given right below the substance. It just makes it easier for me. And this problem is asking you, how many grams of oxygen are formed? Remember, you can't go directly from grams of one substance to gram of another substance. That's a three-step problem. If you didn't jot down the mole map on the last slide, you may want to do it now. Or on this slide, I put it here again. All right, so start with our given information as always. Uh, the first step was to get the given information into moles, and that's really always your first step. If the given information isn't already in moles, that's the first thing you need to do is put it in moles. We do that by dividing by the molar mass of KClO3, and we get that we have this many moles of KClO3. I'm carrying extra digits. Remember not to round or worry about sig figs to the very end of a calculation. We have two more calculations to do. Once you have moles of the given information or the given substance, you can then use mole ratio to get to the substance of interest, which is oxygen in this problem. How do you know what numbers to use here? Remember that in a mole ratio, you look at the coefficients in a balanced reaction. The coefficient in front of oxygen is 3, 
the coefficient in front of potassium chlorate is 2. When you carry out that math, you get now that so far we have that 25.5 grams of potassium chlorate can produce 0.312 moles of oxygen. Now typically the problem will ask you for the mass of product that can be produced, so our third and last step is to convert from moles of oxygen to grams of oxygen. And of course, that's going between grams and moles is always using the molar mass. Be careful um, when you start doing this, be careful of your diatomics. So while the mass of one oxygen atom is exactly 16 grams per mole, remember that oxygen, the element oxygen, is diatomic, so its molar mass is 32 grams per mole. Here's one for you to do. Um, I've had plenty of students tell me that they believe stoichiometry was the most difficult topic in Chem 1211. So it's really important that you force yourself to work through a lot of problems. So I would turn the video off at this point you can back up the slides if you need to kind of review what to do and see how far you can get through this problem. Just a hint for you, you always need a balanced equation before you get started on any stoichiometry. So if the balanced chemical equation is not given, you need to write it yourself. So if you need to remind yourself what a combustion reaction looks like, then go back and look at that. And the first thing you need to do Write the combustion reaction, see if you can balance it. How did you do with balancing the reaction? And I just discovered my pen can come in different colors. Cool. Um, here's the balanced combustion reaction for, I think that was glucose, right? Um, I hope you did well. I hope you balance, were able to balance. It's quite a bit tricky because this, the thing you're combusting has oxygen in it itself, and a lot of people overlook that. So once you have the balanced reaction, you can do the three-step calculation. Now in the last example, I did the three different calculations separate. I, got an, I stopped and got an answer after every step and set up a new calculation. That's fine to do it that way. If you are comfortable, you can also do these calculations in kind of a long run-on calculation. So we, here's our given information, one gram of glucose. Remember that step one is to convert from grams to moles of glucose. You do that by dividing by the molar mass of glucose. Step two, now we're doing it all in one big spread, is once you have moles of glucose, you can now use the mole ratio to get moles of water. Okay. You're going to make sure the moles of glucose is in the denominator for your mole ratio. The six moles of water comes from the balanced equation, as does the one mole of glucose. That's understood to be a one. The third and last step is to convert. You now have moles of water, and you want to convert it to grams of water. You always go from moles to grams or grams to moles by using molar mass. So your answer is 0 0.600 grams of water can be produced by combusting one gram of glucose. So here's that calculation kind of in more steps, just in case it makes sense. If it confuses you, just skip it. Um, but just in case it helps you, it's set up like the mole map. So where we start with grams of one substance, um, then we use molar mass to get moles of that substance. Then we use mole ratio to get moles of the substance we're interested in, which is water in this case. And then use the molar mass of water to get to the answer, which is grams of water. Now comes the rather tricky part. When you're doing stoichiometry and chemical reactions, there's something called a limiting reactant. And this purple isn't showing up as much. Let's see. Let's try that. So the limiting reactant is quite simply the reactant that runs out first. Okay? 
And why is that important? Why do we care about limiting reactant? Because as soon as one of the reactant runs out, guess what? The reaction stops. So the limiting reactant is controls the entire reaction. It controls how much of the other reactant will react. It controls how much product could possibly be made. So the first thing you need to do in any stoichiometry problem is to figure out if there's more than one reactant, which one of the reactants is limiting, and therefore which is the one that's going to control all the quantities. The amount of product that is made or could possibly be made from the limiting reactant is called the theoretical yield. It's a very important vocabulary word for this unit. And the reactant that is left over, that is not used up first, is called the excess reactant. So here's a rather simple example. You have methane, it's another combustion reaction, and the problem tells you you're starting with five molecules of methane, and of course I wrote it under methane, and eight molecules of oxygen, and it wants to know which is the limiting reactant. So is the limiting reactant CH4 or is the limiting reactant oxygen? And can you tell just by looking at the chemical equation? Absolutely not. Do not get lulled into a feeling that, well, let's see, five, there's less of CH4, so that's limiting, right? No, because it depends on all sorts of things. It depends on the mole ratio of the two. It depends on the molar mass of the two. Um, so you really have to go through a calculation to determine, determine which reactant is limiting. So here are the basic steps we go through to solve a limiting reactant problem. The first thing you have to do, you basically have to do two stoichiometry calculations, which is really a pain. You have to calculate the amount of product that could possibly be made from each of these reactants individually. So in other words, you have to calculate how much product could be made from five moles of methane if it all reacted, and then in a separate calculation, calculate how much product can be made from eight moles of oxygen. The reactant that makes the least amount of product is the limiting reactant. That's the one that's going to run out first. So remembering what I just said on the last slide, um, the first thing you have to do is you have to calculate how much each of these reactants, how much product each of these reactants can make. So it didn't specify what product, so I'm just going to randomly pick one. Okay, if they don't specify a product, just pick one. So I'm going to first figure out how much carbon dioxide can be made from five methane molecules. So typical stoichiometry. Um, five methane molecules or moles, whatever you want to call it. Now, since we're already in molecules or moles, we don't need molar mass. Okay, we skip that step. But we do need the mole ratio of carbon dioxide, which is what we're trying to get to, um, to CH4. And if you look at the balanced equation, they're present in a one-to-one -one ratio. So what this tells us is that five moles or molecules of methane can make five moles or molecules of CO2. Like, okay, so then tuck that answer into your back pocket because you're going to have to come back. So the methane can make five CO2. Let's see how much CO2 the oxygen could make if it all reacted. All right, so if we start with eight moles or molecules of oxygen, again, we don't have to go through molar mass because we're already in a counting unit of molecules or moles. So the balanced equation tells us that for every two oxygen molecules, we make one carbon dioxide. So the mole ratio is one to two. So that tells us then when you do the calculation that eight molecules of oxygen can produce four molecules of CO2. Do you remember how much CO2 the CH4 could make on the last slide? It could make five CO2s. 
and eight oxygen can make four CO2s. So which of these reactants makes the least amount of product? Okay, the least amount of product is the four CO2, which means that oxygen is our limiting reactant. Now, it's also important to realize that once you identify the limiting reactant, in our case oxygen, the amount of product that the limiting reactant makes, okay, so in this case 4CO2, is the theoretical yield. Theoretical yield must be calculated from the limiting reactant. Give this one a try. Don't get too frustrated if you have to keep looking back at your notes, but challenge yourself, see if you can do this. I was nice here and gave you a balanced reaction. Whoop, guess what? I forgot there's a subscript here. Yeah, chlorine is diatomic. Okay, so, and I even put the numbers under here for you. If you have four moles of hydrogen gas and you react it with two moles of chlorine gas, how much HCl can you make? How do you identify that this is a limiting reactant problem? Because I won't always say what's a limiting reactant. If, and this is how you identify, if the reactants, if you have more than one reactant and quantities are given for both of them, it is a limiting reactant problem. And you have to do two separate stoichiometric calculations. So we're going to have to do one calculation where we figure out how much product can be made from four moles of H2 and a separate calculation which tells us how much product can be made from two moles of chlorine gas. So go ahead and shut the video off and see if you can work this out. So here's the first calculation, uh, four moles of H2. Again, since the problem was nice enough to give us moles instead of grams, um, we can go directly to the mole ratio. If you look at the balanced reaction, let me write it again here. There we go. Um, you can see that the two is for the HCl and the one for the hydrogen. So that tells us that the four moles of hydrogen, if it all reacted, could make eight moles of hydrochloric acid. Let's see how much hydrochloric acid can be made from the two moles of chlorine that's thrown in the reaction. Well, the mole ratio of chlorine to HCl is one to two, one chlorine for every two HCl. So the two moles of chlorine can make only four moles of HCl if it all reacted. So this four moles of HCl is the smaller number, it's our theoretical yield, and the reactant that it came from, which is Cl2, is the limiting reactant because it made the smallest amount of product. We're going to wrap this first lecture up by talking about three different types of yield. Yield is what chemists call their product, how much product they make. And yield is never 100%, okay? Whatever you calculate for theoretical yield, um, that you essentially never get that. And that's because there are side reactions. Um, some reactions you'll learn in Chem 2 have an equilibrium, and they never really go totally to completion. So chemists are happy if they get a yield over about 50%, honestly. So... Um, We've already talked about theoretical yield. Theoretical yield is what you calculate from the limiting reactant. It has to be calculated. And now here's a second yield. The actual yield is what the chemist makes in the lab. You have to be told that. You have to be given the actual yield in a problem. You don't know. It depends on the chemist, depends on the equipment they have. So actual yield can be all over the place. Now, finally, the third and last type of yield I want you to understand is called the percent yield. The percent yield basically tells you what percentage or portion 
of the product did you make compared to how much could have possibly been made if the reaction went perfectly? So percent yield is the ratio of the actual yield over the theoretical yield times 100. Percent yield, the highest it can be, is 100%. That means you made it all. So, but you should almost never see that. I mean, you'll see 90, 80, 70, and down lower. If you get a percent yield over 100%, you did something wrong because you can't make mass out of nothing. So let's calculate a couple of yields. Let's look at the reaction between aluminum and bromine to make aluminum bromide. And let's see, six grams of aluminum. What do they mean when they say excess bromine? They're being nice to you. They're not making a limiting reactant problem. When they say excess, that means there's plenty of bromine. Don't worry about it. It's not going to be the one that runs out. So what does that tell you? That tells you that the other one that's not in excess is your limiting reactant. So you know that aluminum is going to control how much aluminum bromide is made. Actual yield, as I said, always has to be given to you. And so the actual yield of aluminum bromide is 50.3 grams. So we want to make a note of that. Now we have to calculate the theoretical yield of aluminum bromide starting with the limiting reactant. All right, so here we go. We know that the aluminum is our limiting reactant, and so we're going to start with it. The problem told us we have 6 grams of aluminum. Here's the molar mass of aluminum. We then get the moles of aluminum by dividing by molar mass. Once we have moles, we can use the mole ratio to get to the product, which is aluminum bromide. And the mole ratio of aluminum bromide to aluminum is 2 to 2. You could also put 1 to 1, same thing. And we find that from 6 grams of aluminum, we could possibly make, if we were perfect, if everything was perfect, 0.22 moles of aluminum bromide. Now, yield is typically preferred by chemists to be in mass because mass is what they can weigh out, um, and moles is pretty abstract quantity. So let's get it into grams. So 0.22 moles of aluminum bromide. The molar mass of aluminum bromide tells us that our theoretical yield of aluminum bromide is 50. 59 grams. And so now we can figure out percent yield. Remember that percent yield is the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield times 100. The actual yield that was given to us in the problem is 50.3 grams. The theoretical yield is what you calculate. And so our percent yield is 85 percent. You try this one. I kind of set it up for you. The reaction is balanced. Okay, you are going to have to ultimately balance your own reaction. So, um, and what is the theoretical yield of ammonia? Now, ammonia, if you don't know already, is NH3 that can be produced from 100 grams of nitrogen and 500 grams of hydrogen. Oops, these both need to be moved over. So first of all, what type of problem is this? It's asking about yield. but They gave us quantities of both the reactants. So guess what? It is a limiting reactant problem. You first have to figure out what the limiting reactant is and then use the limiting reactant to calculate theoretical yield. So... If 100 grams was actually produced, that is the actual yield. So make a note of that. And turn off the video and see if you can work this out. Here's the problem worked out. All right. So in, the first thing we have to do is figure out what the limiting reactant is. So we have to take both quantities given of the reactant and figure out how much product they can each make. So 100 grams of nitrogen, okay, we figure out moles of nitrogen, then we go to the balanced equation and use mole ratio of the product NH3 to N2, 
and we find that the 100 grams of nitrogen can make 7.14 moles of ammonia. Now you could carry that to grams if you want, but you can also determine limiting reactant just from the moles of the product. Not from the moles of the reactant, but from the moles of the product. So now let's take the given amount of the other reactant, which is 500 grams of hydrogen. Divide by its molar mass. Hydrogen's another diatomic, so the molar mass is 2.02. .02. Get it into moles of hydrogen, and then you can use the mole ratio of hydrogen to NH3. Let's see, if you look at the balanced equation, there are three hydrogens for every two NH3 made. So there's the mole ratio. And that tells us that hydrogen, that this 500 grams of hydrogen, if it all reacted, would make 165 moles of NH3. We have a grossly limiting reactant here. Which one of these reactants made the least amount of product? Clearly, this is your theoretical yield in moles. You're probably going to want to get it in grams. And going back to the reactant, where did this 7.14 mole value come, come from? It came from the nitrogen. So the nitrogen is our limiting reactant. So now we know our theoretical yield. It needs to be converted to grams before we can get percent yield. All right, so this is just repeating what we did on the last page, so you can kind of ignore that if you want. Here's what we just did on the last page. Here's our theoretical yield in moles. So now I'm going to take that theoretical yield, multiply it by the molar mass of NH3, and here's my theoretical yield in grams. So 122 grams of ammonia could possibly be made in this reaction. And finally, end this up by calculating percent yield. Percent yield, actual over theoretical. The actual yield was given in the problem. It's 100 grams. And we just calculated the theoretical yield from the limiting reactant. Multiply by 100, and the percent yield is 82%. Now here's a wager for you. And this is only going to be the people who listen to the pre-recorded lecture. I'm going to put a bonus question on your Unit 2 test, and that bonus question is going to ask you to calculate how much excess reactant is left over. So now the limiting reactant runs out, and that's going to determine the yield of product, but you're going to have some leftover excess reactant. It's kind of a complicated calculation. It's in your book. I'm sure you can find a YouTube video about it. But if you're interested in tackling that bonus on the next test, you will want to teach yourself how to do this. It's optional, though. It'll only be a bonus question.